Hello, 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 and welcome to The Loudcast with your host, me, Katie Ailes, still here, still in my flat in Leith, that I share with your usual host, Kevin McLean. You will notice that I am not Kevin McLean. That's because we have locked him in my usual office cupboard for this interview. We are going to talk to him. Uh, What we decided to do for this episode is we have turned the table. So the first episode of this series of The Loudcast was Kev interviewing me. And then we figured what it might be fun to do was for the final episode, flip it around and have me interview Kev. And that's because, you know, he's had this entire uh, series of listening to folks, interviewing folks, getting a lot of different perspectives on spoken word. And so we wanted to, you know, give him the chance to share a little bit about what he has thought about throughout this series and, you know, for me to grill him on his creative practice. So we're going to get to all of that in a little bit. But first, as always, we are starting off the episode with a couple of poems. So the first poem that we're sharing is one that we released last week. Um, It is a poem by Kevin. So I hope that you like Kevin. Otherwise, this episode is very... Kevin heavy. So, you know, get used to Kev. He's a good guy. We like him. Uh, So the, yeah, this first poem is called I Want. It is one of Kevin's uh, older pieces, actually, but we just created this video for it. Um, And it is set to footage of two of our dearest friends' weddings. Um, So Fiona Liddell and Sam Thorne's wedding in the summer of 2019. And Fiona and Sam also graciously provided the backing music uh, for this video as well. So here we go. Kevin McLean, I want. Enjoy. I want to be a mountain so that you and I can stand side by side and make valleys together. I want to be the east coast of America, so you can be the west, and when separation puts our love to the test, a nation will build railroads for us. I want to be the sun, so you can be the moon, and when we align, the whole world will look up, but it'll be so dark, only we can see what we're doing. I want to be Adam and Eve before the shame of fig leaves, so we can be the first to experience kiss and touch and love And last, I want to be Batman. So you can be Wonder Woman and we can make fun of Aquaman together, I guess. What I'm trying to say is, I want you. And I want you to want me too. I want to swim in your eyes, not because they're blue, but because they have unexplored depths. And I want to dive to the bottom of you. I want you to be my first sober first kiss. I want you to make up for all the drunken ones I've missed because I honestly can't think of a drink. I want to taste more than your lips. I want to be every blade of grass. So when at last the sun begins to rise, I know you'll be holding me like morning dew, I guess. What I'm trying to say is, I want you, and I want you to know. I don't say this with ease. I was ready to swear off love for good until you swept in like an ocean breeze and blew my line in the sand back into beach again. And I've tried to say this a million times before, but instead I write love poems. And now I don't have to anymore. I think I've got something in my eye. (coughs) Yep, so that was Kev performing I Want. Uh, Massive, massive thanks to Fiona and Sam for allowing us to use footage of their wedding and also for providing the musical accompaniment for that video. Uh, We love them very, very dearly. Um, And we just have one final video before we get to my interview with Kev. Uh, And we wanted to share the last of the Return to Form videos with you guys. Um, Obviously, this is a project that we've been really devoted to over the last couple of months, and it is now wrapped. We are incredibly proud of how it came out. Um, We got to spotlight five different poetic forms, commissioned 10 poets based in Scotland to write and perform their poems uh, in these forms. And I also created workshops guiding you through how to write in these forms. So you can check 
check out all of those videos on our channel. So if you're watching on YouTube, just make sure that you subscribe so that you get all of our fabulous videos. Um, if you are listening to us on one of the audio podcast uh, platforms, please just head on over to YouTube and search I Am Loud Productions and you will find all of our good stuff there. Um, but without further ado, um, this is the final form that we looked at in Return to Form and it's the Sestina, which is arguably the most challenging poetic form, at least that we looked at in this series. It's quite complex. Uh, and we asked Paul Case and Gray Crosby to write Sestinas for us. They both absolutely smashed it. So here we present the Sestinas by Paul Case and Gray Crosby. Enjoy. Return to Form is a project exploring different styles of poetry. We pair up two poets, challenging them to use the same form and the same inspirational material to show how totally different pieces can be created from the same starting point. Sestina a complex poetic form in which six words are repeated in varying orders at the end of each line. Doing 80 down the A1. Rings of fumes trailing. Last rites circle me like vultures, mean twitching silhouettes that know my hour has come. Here's the point. There comes a point where living rings you out like a cheap hour. You find yourself flapping, slick with oil right on the shore. No refuge, blind to what it means. Doing 80 down the A1. I mean, where's the point in a world so sharp that knows how to burst the tutelar ring you've etched around your feet that writes your to-do list and shreds it within the hour? Doing 85 down the A1. What was our land whips past me. A mean of my dreams and past struggles. The rights we settled for. The point lost as the hill's flames burn rings in the singed marshmallow clouds. What I know is broken. What I know is a week crumbled into hours, scattered in rings around minutes, means of escape dashed in seconds, the point battered in with every blink. Right now, doing 90 down the A1. I write my future in concrete streams and know the hectic calamitous points that ushered me to this hour. The chaos that gnaws the means of hope and vomits the hell I ring. I stumble on the point at the last moment, right between the ring road and only what I know. That the hours I lived were lost to the means. It's a someone's died kind of call vast concrete. The kind that shakes your conscious at an unknown hour. But what you do know is that something isn't right. With each earthquake vibration and drilling ring, I feel my life compass point shifting. And it's tempting to let it ring off into a bad dream, but no. I squint at the screen and my stomach lurches. No. Turns to sinking concrete. Maybe I was stupid to think we were past this point. We've been here hour after hour, rung roses around this ring. Surely the house move, the sick leave made it clear, right? But then your sense of wrong and right has always been skewed, and you never could swallow a no. I remember how the river gulped when you threw that ring. How you could go from soft smile to concrete and disappear for hours, your tears, your scars, twisting the point. And here I am again, held at gunpoint. Because if I don't answer, I'm the bad guy, right? Because this could be it. The hour, the minute you finally... No, don't imagine drops in concrete, river bloated fingers reaching that drowned ring. 
I take a breath, jump in. I told you not to ring. I listen for breathing. Wasn't that always the point? Try not to imagine a fall that I'm already talking to concrete. Then, finally. Hey babe, you doing alright? Sorry, must have misdialed. Long time though, no? I let the seconds stretch to a silent hour. And I have put in hour after hour after hour. Enough to detect beer breath, the ring of a smile, hear how it curls the edges of those words, and no. I hang up. Make my point. There are too many wrongs here to right. I can't change that the city's made of concrete. Instead, I line up hours of sleep sheep, watch them jump fences, and point my mind towards dreams, not sunken rings or wrongs and rights. I let the sun creep in as I practice crafting those made of concrete. And those were the tremendous Sestinas by Paul Case and Greg Crosby that they wrote for our Return to Form series. It's Sestinas are such a challenging form and they absolutely smashed it out of the park. So well done to them. Uh, if you want to see the rest of the videos created for Return to Form, you can check out this playlist. And there are also workshops for all of the forms that you can check out at that playlist. Um, so it is time, guys. I'm so excited to welcome our guest. He's actually let me host, so I feel very, very powerful here. But please, wherever you are, whether you are feeding your cats, doing your dishes, out for a walk, out for a run even, please give a massive round of applause and the biggest possible welcome you can to Kevin McLean. I hate this. I know. I know you do. Isn't it great? How are you enjoying my tiny cramped cupboard? It's awful. Uh, yep. I didn't realize you were living under exactly these conditions. Uh, I miss my big comfy chair in I the know you next do. spacious living room. The lighting's better, I'll give you that. Yep. Um, but yeah, I've never asked people to actually clap at home for the guests before, so that was unique. That's I, I, I want them to. <laughs> yeah, I feel like your your presence in the guest chair deserves some celebration, so um, I, I hope you feel applauded. I do, I do. I feel your enthusiasm seeps through. Good. <laughs> so, um, yeah, to kick off, because I, I want to promise everyone listening that this is not just going to be me and Kev talking crap to each other for 60 minutes, although, you know, a good proportion of it probably will be. But we are here to talk about poetry and creative practice. Um, so to kick things off, obviously, we just watched the Sestinas that were created by Paul Case and Gray Crosby. So... Yeah, just first impressions. Well, I say first impressions. You've been project managing Return to Form for the last several months. <laughs> so I suppose last impressions. Um, but yeah, what do you wow. what do you think of these Sestinas? I mean, obviously, you know, we'll speak specifically about the Sestinas and stuff, but um, the whole project in general kind of gets the same vibe from me. I've just been ecstatic with, like, how it's turned out. And... Um, like I know you'll you'll know that return to form has been a thing that's been kicking about my brain for a while, yes. and um, I just I really like the concept of it. The kind of like the I, you know, I'm the, I I like that. That's what I'm all about. Is kind of like interest and concept stuff. Like it's even like when in our live shows and stuff, I always try and make sure the. Um, you know the, the way the night operates is just slightly different something slightly unique about it or whatever uh, and Return to Form kind of worked out perfectly that way and it was a good chance to kind of get 10 poets that I just really like um, one to get you know the chance to kind of pay people during lockdown is huge um, and something that was a kind of big thought behind it um, but then just to present poetry nicely you know I, I know everyone's kind of forced into you know scraping by in lockdown and trying to do do their best and it was nice to be able to do something so complete and rounded that you know when when people go to our youtube channel you know years from now or whatever and find that 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 series of videos 
you wouldn't be able to necessarily connect it to being made during lockdown. And I think that's that's the real kind of power of it. But specifically to to um, Gray and Paul, uh, they did amazing jobs. Sestina is one of the hardest forms in the list that, yep. we, that you came up with. I should just point out for everyone that found their return to forms difficult. I didn't choose the forms. That's all no. Katie Ailes. That, that um, was all me. I do apologize to all of the poets. Um, yeah, yeah, they, they weren't easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think I think Gray and Paul kind of kind of got the rough end of the stick. Yeah, um, yeah. Like his, his sustainers are really hard, and especially yeah. you know we we gave them a kind of specific word list and things like that, which which we thought was helpful, but maybe <laughs> made it a bit harder. Yeah, um, but it is what it is, and, and, and I, I really rose to the challenge. And like I, uh, yeah, I, a big big fan of both Gray and Paul, um, and like their y- y- styles. I thought Gray, um, especially. Gray's fascinating to me because they absolutely nailed the form of it, like all the kind yes. of tricks and, and stuff you would you would plug about Sestinas, but it also sounds like free form writing. Yeah. Which is incredibly Which is just, hard. Yeah, when you're writing yeah. in form to to not make it sound like you're writing in form. And and yeah. I think both of them absolutely smash that. It doesn't feel constrained or artificial or shoved, yeah. you know, d- with difficulty into a form, yeah. I mean, like, I think with Paul's, like, it's it's more obviously a poem. <laughs> Definitely <it's> poetry. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I mean... What did Karis like, Matthews there's... say to you last week, Kevin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. um, but, but in terms of, you know, that sort of repeated refrain, although, yeah. it, you know, it changes throughout the piece and stuff, but there is that kind of underpin to each uh, little, you know, stanza, or, or not quite stanza, yeah. but, you know, set of lines or whatever, um, that, you know, is more familiar. I still think mm. Paul does something, you know, super creative and interesting within there. That the you know the frenetic pace that he builds through that repeating refrain and the the increasing speed. But I think it's it's it was super interesting to see what was almost like a a stream of thought from Gray. Yeah, that, that sort that of meditation, is incredibly yeah. structurally poetic. Mm. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite things, and I think um, with writing in form, and I think that you see it most clearly with the Sestina, because we not only said write a Sestina, but we gave them those end words and said <laughs> you need to use three out of the six of them, and they ended up using five out of the six of them, um, so there's only one word different. But they managed to write completely different poems um, with totally. sort of different tones, as you point out, and I think that that's such a... A valuable thing to recognize about writing in form that just because um, you have to follow certain restrictions does not mean that everything is going to end up coming out cookie cutter, right? It's uh, it will still be unique and individual, which is quite powerful. I mean, I'm someone that doesn't come from like a particularly <laughs> poetic background. Like I don't, you know, um, a lot of my early writing is more like way more you know performance influence and stuff like that and like from from seeing and replicating you know like watch and do right but um, yeah i think as i've as i've been more exposed to literature over over the years and like you know writing forms and stuff the one thing that good you know strong writers who are you come from that background the one piece of advice i see them consistently give to people trying to you know improve writing practice and learn form is that form is a tool to be used yeah. and not a law to be adhered to. Yes. And and yeah. like if you're doing something like a sestina or univocal and you change your mind, you don't want to use that word there, then don't like who cares? Yeah. Especially if you're gonna be performing it, because then you're you're in the situation of being like, well, it's so hard to you know, you could perform a sestina and like that Gray could perform that sestina and the audience isn't gonna immediately go, What a marvelous sestina. They're gonna be like <laughs> yeah that was lovely um so yeah you know i, I think that's my kind of I, I i've really enjoyed return to form because it's it's given you know even though i, I wasn't doing any of the <laughs> forms um, it gave you know you looking at the workshops and and seeing the forms come in and deciding how they're going to you know creatively be brought to life in in terms of video work gave a huge amount of insight into those forms and i know we've got plans for napa rimo coming up and stuff and like revisiting some of those forms and i think i'm, I'm really excited actually to try and tackle them rather than kind of 
where I was with form maybe before it, where I was just kind of intimidated by it. <laughs> I do, yeah, I do want to pick up on that because, um, and, and give a little bit of insight into how we tend to work as a company um, because, you know, you're a creative director and, and that can mean different things in different artistic organizations. But what it has <laughs> meant with us is that, um, I mean, you wear many, many hats, Kev. <laughs> so many hats. Um, but probably your biggest hat is sort of the ideas guy. Um, and I think that that can sometimes be used in like a derogatory way, but that's not how I mean it. You are someone who is constantly th- thinking about, as, as I think you mentioned earlier, how to innovate and how to go beyond what we've been doing. It's really interesting because, as you mentioned, you're not someone who tends to write a lot in form. You know, this isn't something that is a priority in your own creative practice, but you were the one who came up with this project. I I had nothing to do with it until you (laughs) convinced us all to do it. Um, And this is sort of a pattern within I Am Loud where we're sort of, you know, doing our thing and everything's going (laughs) great. And then you go, no, we should do this bonkers idea and push forward. And we all go, Kev, why? Kev, it's working. And you go, no, we need to push forward. Um, And I just sort of wanted to acknowledge that for folks who who maybe don't know how I Am Loud works, but also um, to pick your brains about, first of all, where the impetus for Return to Form came from, but also more broadly, how you perceive the role of a creative director of a company in terms of innovating within, you know, the, pushing forward the the creative practice of that company. It's interesting, you know, I think with, with Return to Form, the idea came from, <laughs> a lot of my ideas come from bitterness. Uh, <laughs> and I think that, that, uh, that like, I, you know, I try and I try and answer the questions that are posed. I guess is a better yeah. way to put that. Like, like when you know when someone, or or fill the gaps that I think need filled or could yeah. could be done better or whatever it is, right? So I looked at something like one of the huge pieces of praise we always receive, and I, I absolutely take it as that is that we're a very like mainstream poetry organization, right? We we swing into the performance side of it. We you know we're associated with slam. We're associated yeah. with like energetic performance based nights and that's great but a lot of people then you know there's a flip side to everything eh? and you can be then seen as being you know less uh poetic like worthwhile yeah. right poetically worthwhile yeah. like is it is it a, a proper literary endeavor to go to to a live poets night or whatever and i often feel that not just is cast at us but is cast at spoken word writers in general right people who yeah. choose to write free form, a choice that is made that that has is just as much merit to it as someone who devotes their life to writing only sonnets. Okay, yeah. so I'm like people like Gray and people like Courtney, uh, and I I bring those those two people up because they specifically um, in feedback for Return to Form mentioned that they elect to write primarily in free form, right? Yeah, and I was like they are as talented as any structural form writer you will see and it is not that they cannot do it it's just a different you know approach or a different idea behind it and i wanted to show it's kind of a a, you know the name is a bit of a jab as well of like return to form right like people think that's the standard you need to be able to write on form and meter and all right we will and we'll do it more entertainingly (laughs) than the people that concentrate on form constantly with no regard to the performance and that was the point to be like okay we've done that now here's us doing univocals and sonnets and all that let's see these people who think that everything is about form and meter put out something as entertaining as return to form was you know what i mean like it's just yeah. it, it's it's throwing that gauntlet back down to other folk i guess uh which is maybe a hostile way to do it but i think i think competition you know and and want to to prove people wrong or to you know show what you can do is often a great motivator absolutely um, and, and I think just yeah. to add in there, um, because you're talking a lot about free form, and I think absolutely, you know, the majority of spoken word artists do tend to write more in free form. But I think also I, there's this assumption that just because you're writing in free form means that you don't use poetic devices, um, which is absolutely maddening. <laughs> I had to have this conversation with some of my university students the other day, and they were, they were reading a Derek Walcott poem, which wasn't an iambic pentameter, and they were like, oh, so what formal elements are there? And I went, oh my goodness, well, look at, you know, there's assonance, there's repetition, there's a refrain, there's intertextuality, there, you know, I can go on. So um, I think a a part of Return to Form that I really valued thinking about and reflecting on was um, 
just recognizing how much form we use already. And there are plenty of spoken word artists who do write in meter and who do use rhyme. But even if you don't use that, you're definitely going to be using rhythm. You know, you're using internal rhyme, you're using all of these other devices. Um, and that actually sort of leads me on to another question for you about um, your own work, because you come from a theater background. Um, and a performance background. And so I wanted to sort of pick your brain on this a little bit about what elements of your um, sort of creative and artistic upbringing you think have most informed your approach to spoken this is, word. This is a horrible conversation, Katie, because it just confirms how rambling and incoherent the questions I've been asking all the guests <laughs> on this live cast have been so far. That's like so concise and, and like interesting and oh, I, I I'm getting really into... comfy in this hosting chair Kev I don't know if I'm gonna want to let this go because <laughs> I didn't I didn't kind of get to the the other one you asked as well about being like a creative director and I think they're, they're yeah. kind of one yeah, of the yeah. same like it, it's kind of easy to answer both here where I, I grew up doing youth theater right so I did like yeah. youth theater from the age of 10 uh, and and you know that was everything I wanted to be an actor I got very interested in it and as I kind of got older I got more interested in like practitioner being a workshop facilitator and I ended up one of my first kind of jobs at high school I instead of kind of going to do uni or college or whatever I um, did a, a kind of volunteer scheme thing at the youth theater and then eventually got employed to, to be a workshop facilitator and um, it's a dude that I always you, you like you know me personally Kate <laughs> so like, do know, I like one of the people I I, I kind of like has been a big role model for me and someone I've often really looked up to and cite you as someone who had a big impact in my life is uh, Michael Richardson, who yeah. is was my creative director at Youth Theatre. Uh, and he's like a really interesting guy. Like he was a, a doctor who then ran Scottish Opera, who then set up a, you know... Uh, and when Kev says doctor, he means like medical doctor. Yeah, he was like, a medical not doctor. Not the sham that, that I am. Gonna like, the director yeah. of... <laughs> I'm going to be the director of Scottish Opera. And I just, I found him so fascinating. And like the biggest thing about Michael was he, he clued into to me a, a really interesting idea that is like this, this term of um, those who can't teach, right? Like it's seen as an insult. And I'm like, I, I, that's not that accurate, right? Those like teachers is a specific skill in itself. But before you even get into that, like there's no harm in realizing where your skill set is, right? Yeah. Like, like Michael knew he could never sing opera. He could sing reasonably, like he could do his thing, but he couldn't sing opera. But he loved it, and so he got into a, a different way to interface with it and, and deal with it. I love performing, and spoken word has always given me a outlet to to perform personally, and I, and I enjoy that. But like, you know, from from making the decision to jump from youth theatre kind of member to practitioner, from potential actor to you know someone who who was interested in the mechanics and the nuts and bolts of it, you know, it led me down that path to where I'm like, I love being a producer and a promoter and a, a creative director because I get to surround myself with, you know, people like yourself, you know, amazing writers, people like Mark and Bex, who are incredible writers in their own right, but also amazing performers, so funny and intelligent, Mark, with these, like, amazing, uh, like, you know, voiceover work and stuff as an actor. That's what he trained to do. Bex is one of the funniest people I know. She writes pure creative insanity. It's amazing. Like Perry is an incredible videographer. Uh, oh, he hates that word. He really, <laughs> You'll go mental. Yeah, don't. Uh, he's, he's Take a that back. Filmmaker. Uh, you know, his, his skills as an editor and what he does with, with sound and stuff. You know, like that's, and I get to exploit those talents. And that sounds like a bad word, right? Exploit those talents. But sometimes you need someone to bring stuff together to make a cohesive idea. And when I look at stuff we've done before, like tours or like, you know, creative ideas like Return to Form, and they don't all work. Let's bear in mind, I did a big fight for the Loud Poets Mixed Martial Poetry Ultimate <laughs> Writing Championship Invitational uh, Grand Prix Tournament, whatever it was called, the LPMMP UWC GPT Invitational. There uh, it is. And that was, you know, like eight people watched those, but we had a lot of fun. So I don't know, <laughs> there's 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 a part of, of I, I like doing creative things. I like breaking out of the mold of, of what we've done before and stuff like that. And you know, I am relative about where my skill is as a writer. I'll never be the best poet in the world, but I bet I could showcase the best poets in the world in mm. the best way. And like, mm. I'm, I'm fine with that. <laughs> See, this is where... I don't know if that answers your question, sorry. No, it, it, it does, you know, about the purpose of a creative director 
um, yeah. not just being because I think that we often tend to sort of separate out the creative from the administrative and I think in your yeah. role a lot of what I see is that they are one in the same you know but because, that's what strikes me right like is, is why sorry to interrupt but to no, answer no. your other question a little bit as well I think that's why I, I love spoken words so much because the thing I really value I value performance I love performing I'm an attention seeker I love being on a stage and people clapping it's an amazing feeling if you know, like, you know some people don't get that my mother always said she was like I just do not grasp how you could do that it's the worst mm. idea in the world I mean she would get drunk and do karaoke but I mean, it's another matter <laughs> so like I think there is that thing in everyone you know if you got it it's like a it's like a drug right you, you latch onto that it's an amazing thing I miss it in lockdown like yeah. it's horrible but I think I I long ago identified that you could express yourself in a lot of ways. You could be creative yeah. in a lot of ways and get that feedback in a lot of ways. And as a performer, and that's kind of, you know, what I look at, I'm like, why single anything out? Spoken mm. word to me is the greatest art form because you are the writer, director, yeah. like dramaturg, you are the strongest critic you are the you know you're the video editor to your own stuff you, you you will find your own music and pair people up like you're your own tour manager and publicist and copy editor and da 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 unless you have lovely friends to do those things for you <laughs> but even then you're your own you know PR person try like you're your own network yeah. skills so it's like I think as a spoken word artist you get these very like rounded engaged creative informed artists who yeah. unfortunately rarely get the chance to do the thing they actually want to do full time which is a pain but yeah I, I think that's my view as a like a performer is I just I think spoken word brings so much so it's like a natural progression if you're an actor who likes reading monologues why not read your own monologue perfectly written for your own character devised in your own head you know what I mean yeah um, yeah it, it was definitely what attracted me to it as well, um, particularly, you know, at the time of my life where I was sort of living alone and, and trying to figure out how to be creative and how to do self-expression to have an art form which I could take from the seed of an idea to the finished product entirely solo was really appealing, um, yeah. particularly because I had I'd been a dancer and that, you know, there still, you can absolutely still choreograph solo and, and do solo performances, but um, so much of my life as a dancer was around studio spaces and communities and collectives, which is fantastic, but when you don't have access to that, um, it's really, really nice That's to have an art form that you're fully in control yeah. of, yeah. Access is a huge thing for me as well. Yes. Like I, you know, I, I had a much better life than you know some people in the world growing up. Absolutely, but like the, <laughs> I always point out, I didn't realize I was like kind of poor until I moved to Edinburgh and met like a bunch of <laughs> uh, humanity students yeah. and was like, oh right, oh god, I was kind of poor. Um, you know, like and youth theater was a place I could go because it was it was cheap. And, and engaging and you could do it with nothing right mm -hmm. you know, just a group of us in a room making up ideas doing little plays like in a way that it's you know I can't afford skis or you know yeah. like or you know loads of art supplies or, or things like that and you go there is there is something in spoken word and it's it's why I think you know spoken word has so many like marginalized voices in it yeah and like the, those are the people that, that rise to kind of real prominence and stuff because it's rooted in like all you need is a is your own mind right you yep. don't even need a pen and a paper like i started when i started writing spoken word i i wrote in my head i didn't i never touched you know pen to paper you looked you know, bonkers totally but it was entirely free and I yes. could go to, uh, you know, an open mic and I could share that and like, yeah. no one else owned it, no one else could touch it, that's my art that I can make, not beholden to anyone or, or you know, a, a cent given out to anyone to, to do it and like, there is something empowering in that for mm. people who cannot access other art forms and so like, I, there's a huge appeal there for me. Yeah, I, I want to sort of dig in a little bit more um, into your writing practice and also what motivates you to write. Um, and when I- <laughs> <laughs> Not enough things. <laughs> but, but this is the thing, because I think um, when, when I met you and we started sort of working creatively together and professionally together, um, we could not have more different 
writing processes and creative processes. <laughs> we are we are totally opposed in that in that yeah. regard. And I find it so interesting because again, there are so many different ways that you can approach spoken word. I came personally from a writing background and there was also dance, but in terms of when I was writing, it was, you know, take down a million different ideas and then maybe come up with a rough draft and then edit it a ton, you know, and, and then maybe revisit it later. And writing would take me absolute ages, but it was all on the page. It was all written down. I have the sort of brain where if I don't write it down, it's gone. Right. And then I met you and you <laughs> at the time, the way that you were writing is you would sort of sit in the middle of our bed in a dark room and you would mutter to yourself and you would be <laughs> I sound like a lunatic I d- it looked nuts but you created beautiful work but but literally what you what you would do is you would just sort of you would come up with the first line of a poem and you would repeat it until you found the second line and then repeat those yeah. two together until you found the third line so it was very top to bottom very linear and there wasn't really any editing and so i wonder no, it if made editing very hard because i'd already because if you repeat a line exactly even in your head that many times it's stuck like yeah it would be impossible to learn another version of the poem yeah. like people used to ask me how do you learn all your poems i'm like i wish i could forget them <laughs> they are lodged in my mind <laughs> So yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that because that's how you started. And then now you tend to have um, a writing process, which is a little bit more like what we might consider a traditional writing process and that you actually use, yeah. you know, pen and paper <laughs> to write. So how how did that evolve for you and and why? And are there any merits of the original system that you would maybe, that you miss maybe? I think, I mean, I... <laughs> The weird thing to say is someone who's kind of devoted their life to professionally writing for the last like four or five years or whatever. I am not a particularly good writer, like, and I mean that like in a like a physical sense. Like, if I have to, or say I'm filling out an application form or doing like a funding app, you know about this, Kate, or or any of those sort of things, I will be able to spiel. You know what I mean? Like, mm. well, I'll be able to talk in the you know whatever form, whether it's you know pseudo academic or you know for buzzwords for a, a, a kind of corporate thing or whatever I can I can code switch that way yeah. um, but then if you if I have to do that by myself like a laptop it just doesn't flow the same way I don't yeah. get it out of my head and you're so most articulate now, when you're speaking yeah which is a, a, a true indictment of the written words I put out. Um, no, <laughs> if you've been if you've been a regular viewer of this podcast, um, but but I think it, yeah, I'm more of a you know I, I like things out loud. I'm more of a, a listener. You know, it's the same with the way I learn. Like I would rather learn through a conversation yeah. or, or or audio or video than than you know reading about it. Uh, I don't I don't read a lot of poetry. I mm. listen to a lot of poetry, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so. I think when I started, again, it kind of goes back to what we were saying about, like, I'm a concept person. So, like, I get, like, an interesting nugget of an idea. Like, a good example is one of my earliest poems, Trip, right? So it's like, I just had, I literally stumbled in the street. And I had that idea of, you know, what's a fairly cliche thing of, like, the, you know, in film where someone trips and it's like that slow motion fall, right? And everything they consider in that moment. Or a similar idea to the the life flashing before your eyes. And so I liked that idea and I got the, I trip and as I fall, you know, like what's happening as I fall, that's where that poem's gonna go. I trip and as I fall, and then it's like, it's easier to kind of speak that out in my head and see what goes next than to be like, okay, well, let's write down all the ideas about falling and all the ideas about tripping and what are some synonyms and where are the, you know what I mean? I would lose the, the, the cut and thrust of what I'm trying to say, at least when I first started. And I think it's like anything, you have to, you have to adapt and hone and get better, right? And like, mm-hmm. it wasn't sustainable to continue to just have my poems in my brain I have more poems now (laughs) they wouldn't all fit Uh, so you know you have to like you have to sacrifice a bit of that to make sure you have versions of things written down and then like you know I'm more accepting of I have lost so much poetry by having a great idea in the middle of the night and and then forgetting it by the time I woke up because I'm not someone who writes it down and you're like there is a there is a downside to that so I'm, I'm still trying to find a balance for myself but I think the important thing is right like when you start writing people can give you advice but it's biased it is according to them it's what has worked for them and that is so rarely in creative practice 
a catch-all. But you, I, I see, you know, people writing, this is the book on how to write screenplays. And you're like, well, then why is everyone not churning out amazing screenplays, right? Because it's, mm. it's specific to you. And you go, all that advice is worthwhile and important and informed, but at the end of the day, you have to find the systems that work for you and continue to, like, address those systems and see if you can, you know, make tweaks and, and if the loss is worth the benefit and stuff. You just need to be kind of considering your practice and I do a lot and like I'm lucky enough to have been given commission work and things like that and you know I've learned to write to deadline and that had a had an effect because it was no longer something I could you know puzzle over in my brain it was like you know this needs to be done by Friday so put it on a page um yeah so I, I think I'm, I'm always open to like new ways of writing and I do much more of what you have suggested now of like word lists and ideas and keeping things you know kind of coherent but it's I still think I'm more of a sculptor where I know mm. what I want to get and I knock away the bits that you know don't fit whereas you are more of a, like a painter where you layer up the strokes mm. and, and add tiny bits and change it as you go and the picture you end up with might not be what you started with in your mind whereas to get a finished statue of the, the you know the, the marble it has to look the same as what I had in my mind you know what I mean is that weird yeah no no I think it's so interesting because again I, I think it's just a difference and and it ties very very well into the next question that I was going to ask Kev um <laughs> I'm a pro you're you're the perfect interviewee here <laughs> um so basically when uh when we were preparing to do this interview I um I mean, I know this man too well. So I had some questions that I wanted to ask him, but I also wanted to get other people's questions to ask him, right? So we put out on our Instagram um, to see if anyone had any questions for Kev. And one of those questions um, is from our, our dear, dear, dear pal, Lloyd Robinson, um, who we miss very much. Um, and he asked, what function other than entertainment should spoken word primarily serve? And I want to sort of as you're thinking about that, add on another another layer because we've had so many conversations about this, just the two of us, that I want to sort of open up to the to the wider audience of the Loudcast. Um, you are not someone who writes for catharsis. Um, we've talked about this a lot. I have never, you know, in the what six and a half years that I've known you, seen you sit down to write for like I've seen you sit down to write let me clarify that um but <laughs> Kev plagiarizes everything no um Shh. sit down to to, <laughs> to write for um to process ideas personally or to sort yeah. of keep a diary or or uh, basically you are not someone who writes things that you do not intend to share and that's sort yeah. of been your philosophy as I understand it for a while so I wanted to ask you about why that is and and um yeah how you go about that but then also sort of combining that with lloyd's question which is um you know what other purposes can spoken word serve because i think for a lot of people it is catharsis um or it is you know uh expressions of oppression or, or uh, rage or wanting society to change and while those are themes in your work they're not maybe the primary reason so yeah, could you? Sorry, yeah. that was a big, chunky old question. But no, no, no I, I get what you mean. It is something we've we've spoken about a, a lot. And like, uh, I love Lloyd. First off, hi Lloyd, uh, you're the best. Um, and I think I think it shows that Lloyd is someone like Lloyd probably writes more, uh, you know, for catharsis and stuff than I do. I think he, mm. you know, uh, he has a history in poetry. But mm. Lloyd is like a, a proper performer. Lloyd gets con gets conceptual and he gets like yeah. you know, really creative and and he is performing for entertainment. He gets what he's doing, yeah. um, and so I think he he sees that like and uh, I think it's important to to perform for entertainment. I have I have my views on on spoken word. Right, I am someone who engages in spoken word in a professional capacity right i have made my my kind of career into into doing poetry and, and or various things but like my main bread and butter is the spoken word community that's where i operate and like that's not for everyone i get that not everyone wants to professionalize just like i when i was youth theater stopped wanting to be a professional actor i mm. just enjoyed youth theater right and you're like there should be open mics 
there should be places where people can go to share emotional work based yeah. in truth, based in, in their lived experiences to, to work through trauma. Absolutely. I'm not even saying, you know, we'll write for a catharsis, but, you know, keep it to yourself. Like the sharing is important. I, I spent a lot of time at Soapbox in Edinburgh, which is an amazing, you know, student open mic, which was a real blurring of the lines between people who you could see who were trying to refine skill and practice and, you know, improve and people who were looking to share and connect and empathize right and those are equally worthwhile yeah. my thing is that we have a lot of the the you know sharing community spaces and mm. we don't have enough of the professionalized um like places where you know it's not open access it, it is about like a, a standard of quality and things like that now, I think that both benefit from each other. <laughs> and I think that if you had a more professionalized, more uh, robust spoken word scene, you would have more community focused, engaged, empathetic spaces. And like I do, I have written cathartically. Like I know, it, like it was, it was a long time ago. But like I, I have written like one poem that was purely like for me that I didn't necessarily intend to perform. I did subsequently perform it, but like, it, you know, it it was written in that idea. And like there, there have been pieces or, or things I have thought of that then I've changed my mind and decided to not share. Yeah. And I think that's an indication of how I've grown as a writer and as and, and as a a member of the spoken word community like I think it is I am healthier like mentally for being a part of a community that is engaged with its its well-being and does care about like being inclusive like and take like I come from a little town where like you know nobody, it's just a bunch of the same people right it's just like stock white guy after stock white guy and that's like a very particular experience whereas like being part of the spoken word community has exposed me to a much wider range of people that I would never have necessarily encountered or would have had a very different relationship and, and exposure to and I think I'm a better person for for that side of spoken word mm. but I think when we put too much focus on it we prevent people who are very skilled and very talented progressing to a stage they they want to and those people leave they don't stop being creative or, or talented they just start applying it somewhere else yeah. and I think that is why we get this you know upper limit to to, to our our you know growth in, in, in the community so I, I think they do need to kind of walk hand in hand I think you know I just it's just not what I do and like people process you know their emotions in different ways and I don't think you need to write cathartically I think it is right it, you know it is okay to do any artistic practice purely because you like doing it or because you like to you know perform or whatever it is you know what I mean like it's not always it doesn't need to be rooted in that but but yeah, yeah I, I I'm all for you know broad strokes and big houses you know what I mean like lead lids why not have every bit of it I think that's the thing there are so many reasons why people take the stage um and you know on the same night you might have someone there who just wants to share an experience and does not want any criticism whatsoever they just want to you know have people witness a story that they are telling and then you might have someone there who is only concerned about skill and then you're going to have people you know in in every shade in between so it's it's challenging and you know obviously this is something that you and i have talked a lot about in the last five years as i've you know talked your ear off about my phd but you know thinking about these things and thinking about how we critique and and how we cultivate safe but also um innovative environments around creating this work and and it's challenging i, I think I don't one think thing, it's I think easy one thing i would want to, want to point out as well is that not writing specifically for catharsis and writing with the intention of sharing with others yeah. is not the same as not really feeling what you're writing and not putting mm. you know your own personal experience and self into it I, I i think again there has probably been whether i'm aware of it or not 
you know, a release, a, a, a valve to writing that, that when I do have something to say, I do have somewhere to put it. You know what I mean? Like, it, it's that thing of, like, intention, sure, isn't there, but that doesn't mean it's not doing that. Just the same way as when you go and engage, you know, when if you do a play, right, if you're in a play, cool, you're doing that for the entertainment of the audience, but you know what you're also doing? Spending time with people. You yeah. know, getting close to them, building intimate relationships, spending time with your castmate, learning your skill, you know, picking up tips from this new direct, like whatever it is. You may be doing it for entertainment, but you are, you, you can't avoid learning and being like emotionally impacted by the world. And I just think spoken word is kind of more open to that idea than, than most art forms. Mm, I definitely feel that. I was um, I, attending an open mic, a, a Zoom open mic, of course, uh, the other night. And I, I haven't done that much over lockdown just because it's been a really busy time for me. And I had the best night ever because um, it, it was Yes We Can't, which is run by uh, poets, prattlers, and pandemonialists who are all based in the black country in the north of England. And um, I literally came Good to this open mic. Absolutely go and check out those, those guys. Yes, there, all yeah. Good. Well, I'll put a link to them down in the description. Um, but they are great hosts and fantastic. And they have such a community around their open mics, which seems to have really thrived in lockdown. And I, I entered the Zoom room and it was about 30 um, majority sort of older English people with very strong Northern accents, like flirting with each other and making fun of each other. And I just immediately, my heart warmed and I was like, oh my goodness, I have missed this. I knew none of them except for the guys hosting it. But um, yeah, I, th I think you're so right. And, and I think it is the element that so many of us are missing right now is, is that community. Um, I just before, cause we are, um, going to sort of start the process slowly of wrapping up but there there's one more question that i wanted to ask so you gentle. um what's that <laughs> so gentle i'm just like oh and we're out of time so peace <laughs> it's you know you gotta you have a few tips to pick up for me kev you know it's uh, i hope i I've hope you're taking notes so much. um <laughs> i've probably spoken more than any guest has been allowed to because i'm usually the host going, but one, but oh, hold on hold on this is You're this is why polite. we've given kev the chance to be a guest because he just won't <laughs> shut up when he's a host so um yep. i haven't brought up wrestling once and you did <laughs> So my final, my final question that I want to ask is, is another guest question. Um, this is from Logan Compow on Instagram. So thank you, Logan, for asking this, because I think it ties in, in really nicely with our conversation. And he asked, do you have poems that you wouldn't read now because of how you've changed since writing them? Um, and I think, you know, we've, we've just talked about how generally your intention isn't catharsis, but sometimes poems can be cathartic anyway. And so I, yeah, I wonder about that for you. I know that there are poems that you don't perform anymore, but my sense is yeah, that that's more been about- they're bad. <laughs> uh, no, no, they're, they're, they're certainly, definitely. Um, I think it's it's interesting because there are lots of poems I, I tend not to perform. Some of those are because like, I don't think they're, you know, I don't think they're up to the standard of my other work. They're just not what I've picked to present myself mm. so like things like you know again because I have always performed right so I like did my first I wrote my first poem immediately performed it and then was you know at gigs so like <laughs> the first three poems I, I I had written were my set right that was just the way it was so, <laughs> which like, is so like unusual for so many spoken word people I, yeah. I feel like I should like <laughs> the first three poems I did at gigs were like my 70 millionth poems and yeah very very different but yours are all very good, so, which is annoying, so. But a couple of them, you know, like the first poem I ever wrote, like that's kind of been, you know, drifted off. I don't use that, like, yeah. cause you know, whatever. But there are some from that period of time I still use cause I think they're still good. And like, I'm, you know, surprised by <laughs> how I managed to churn them out. Um, but I think uh, there, there's there's one example uh, that, that comes to mind. There was a poem um, that I wrote he, like very early on you know it was in my f sort of first half dozen poems of ever writing and I still don't think I still don't think I actually said anything bad in the poem if you know what I mean mm. um, but I think I was less sophisticated in my language and I, I mentioned a thing about like makeup and it was like uh, you know it, it, it was that that kind of cliched suggestive idea of like you know Oh, why wear makeup? You're so pretty without. Don't bother. And I was like, it's not exactly what I was saying, but I could see how it could be taken as that. And it was like kind of judgmental about, you know, women who 
you know choose to wear high heels or you know extensions or big eyelashes and stuff which is you know totally up to any individual and something I fully understand now that you know I wouldn't then talk or tackle that subject and that poem it doesn't actually really say anything it's just kind of you know a bunch of cliches about you know standard stuff and I'm like I don't think it was offensive I don't think it's like oh you should never do that poem again but it doesn't kind of represent what I think now or like fit with you know yeah just anything yeah. so I'm, I'm like it just kind of got ditched and like it, but I learned stuff from the poem you know what I mean I still value it because like it was a piece in the puzzle of progressing my writing and like the conversations I had uh, out of that poem you know with people who did kind of go oh dude maybe that's a bit you know or you know does this make sense actually informed me and changed you know made me smarter on the subject so like yeah there, there are poems I've abandoned either through quality or through just you know your 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 opinion and your your you know mindset becomes more sophisticated right mm. I think because I think that this is one of the things that we talked about a bit um, at the start of this loudcast series uh, when the chairs were flipped and um, and you were interviewing me because we talked a little bit about my poem swallow um, which is yeah. a sort of a similar situation where I had written this poem that was then um, interpreted in a way that was not intentional and and I'm very carefully not saying misinterpreted because you know once a poem's no, out in the poetry, world man, you know what I mean? yeah like, every I mean, interpretation is know, legitimate um but that can be kind as much of, as as much yeah. as you haven't you know what I mean as much as when people go oh well, you've see, you're saying this you're entitled to be like well no I'm not saying that you're you're interpreting you're that reading way. that but yeah that doesn't that doesn't make their interpretation wrong you have exactly. left it open to that you've not been clear enough in your language right yeah and, and it, so it's you so can challenging that or edit it yeah. Or you can accept that, or you can not. Like it's, it's totally up to you. But like, but I, you know, I I think you should be, you should never be so sure of your own rightness that, mm. that the opinion of more experienced or uh, you know opinions that you not even necessarily more experienced, but just opinions you value and people yeah. you know in the scene, not in an angry or upset way or whatever, just were like huh, that doesn't kind of make sense to me. Oh, I think that's a bit, mm. you know, like, like especially, and it was great, a bunch of, you know, female poets who know what the f they're talking about and, like, were willing to come up and have that conversation with me and yeah. give me that advice and give their input and be like, oh, this is how I saw that. And I was like, oh, my God, no, right, oh, I did not realise that's how that would come off. And, like, you had a similar reaction. I don't yeah. think you should be, I think if you're too protective of your own work or too assured of your own correctness, then you're not going to ever grow, in, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, just in general, whether that's poetically or, or in your own work. I think it's a really good question. Thank you, Logan. Like that's that's yeah. It's interesting because I hadn't really thought about it. But yeah, I just don't do that poem. It wasn't like, and I banished this poem. <laughs> it was just that yeah, it doesn't make it into the sets. Right? <laughs> how how would one banish a poem? Yeah, tricky tricky questions. Uh, I'd get Andrew Blair to burn it in a bonfire with the flyers from the fringe. That's I, I'm, I'm pretty Ooh. sure Andrew is in charge of um, poetic yeah. magic. Yeah, Andrew, we in, in we might city. hit you up. Got yeah, a got yeah, some yeah. burning to do. <laughs> and on that absolutely terrifying note, um, the the way that we always end the loudcast is by asking the guest to read a poem. Um, and so, yeah, Kevin, would you would you grace us with a poem? I know that you've already done a poem at the top of this podcast, so this feels very extravagant. Um, either you're being treated Kev. to two That's Kev poems, or you poor thing, you must suffer through. Um, <laughs> but yeah, would you would you like to give us a poem? I will, and I thought actually, uh, it's interesting, because I was going to do this poem anyway, but then when you were talking about it, I was like, there's an interesting aspect of how I used to write, which was in my head, and it would help me memorise poems, and then I've switched to kind of writing out more, and now I don't know how to memorise any of my poems. <laughs> so this yep. one, I don't, I don't know, and so I hardly ever perform it. Yeah. Um, just because I don't know it, which is really irritating. I should just learn it, but yeah. Uh, it doesn't have a title either. I'm not good at titles. It's unacceptable. Got to give it a name. Well, if the lovely people watching the loudcast want to give it a name afterwards, I'll take whatever the top comment is. Like, Post it in the comments. Sure. Uh, I know I'm going to regret that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> I do not write my poetry. My talent lies in the inflection. I do not write my poetry. I write the poetry of the masses, or so the tagline would tell you. 
the safe and the sensible, easily understood rhyme structure to make it instantly accessible. Note tackling the big subjects, a fair trade to be considered successful. My poetry sings in a voice my tongue has long since unwound itself from. It sings struggle songs, tunes whose picket lines I've stood upon, the scratch in the record, the split of a home. The struggle, a fight I would still call my own, but that tone echoes off my walls. So I soften the acoustics with love poems, double quilted simile, isn't our collab piece silly, off topic trickery until no one considers me to be where I'm from. And that's fair. I left home long before my family knew I was gone. At age 12, I changed the shape of my tongue, cast off amarnies and iums, but still to this day, a phone will ring when family calls, and Glasgow notes will sing from a foreign throat. But my daily tone is that which a performer would use, a poor excuse for a long-known but seldom-spoken truth. There is shame in the tone of home. I spent years trying to mimic the patterns of my peers. I hopscotched my diction into line, devoted precious time trying to crack my spine into the shape of a life that could never be mine. There is no bone that is safe from being broken. I learned that lesson slowly. And I firmly believe you need to know where you've been to see where it is that you are going. And it is so easy to get lost in all that running. Mm. Oh, clappy clap clap, clappity clap clap clap. <laughs> I, I, There's see, that clap injection I needed. Oh, oh it's soothing. <laughs> yeah. you, you get a little bit, you get a little bit. No, see, this is why I hate it when you say that you're like not a good writer or whatever, because uh, no. Um, I didn't and I, say I'm not a good writer. I said I'm never going to be the best writer. And that's <laughs> fine. Like I'm, I'm happy with yeah. my stuff. I like my, I like my style, and there are people yeah. that like it too, and that means the world to me. You know, what I mean, I'm yeah. like it is what it is. And, and as much as I don't write poetry, you know, for me, for catharsis, whatever, I, mm. I do write it to entertain people. But like, you know, I think people mostly are, and so that is, I'm, I'm doing my job. And, and in a bigger way, I get to showcase some, so much more poetry yeah. that, like, I so enjoy that inspires me to try and be a better writer and like always improve and so that's you know i couldn't ask for more from 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 what i do with i am loud well kev i was gonna make fun of you there but now it's just i <laughs> don't want to so um <laughs> i guess he's won uh yes victory for kev <sighs> great i'll have to get you back on the loudcast extra that's the problem um <laughs> speaking nice, of nice. which we have a loudcast extra. Um, if you enjoy this loudcast, if you enjoy any of our loudcasts, you can sign up for our Patreon. There is a link below. You can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. Um, there are all sorts of different tiers that you can use um, with a lot of different perks, some exclusive features, lots of good stuff like that. Um, so if you are interested, we always put up a Loudcast Extra episode. Um, you'll notice that I only asked two audience questions on this episode of the Loudcast. Um, there are many more. And many of them are ridiculous. So I'll be grilling Kev on those in the extra, um, along with a lot more shenaniganry and may maybe some serious chat about poems. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. I might even let him talk for a single hey. minute about wrestling, if he's good. Oh, wow. um, <laughs> I just wanted to plug as well, uh, before we wrap up, that... Um, in April, uh, through Napo Rymo, I've been I've been kind of chatting to to the crew, and we're going to be doing our um, Napo Rymo specials. So we're going to have a, a weekly kind of Napo Rymo special coming out. Uh, they're going to kick off, you know, uh, like late March uh, to get ready for for National Poetry Writing Month. So like you know, continue to check these out. Uh, and like just so you know, this is the last loudcast for. Um, You're really stealing weeks. my thunder here, Kev. I thought you were going to let me host this one. Or you, I thought I just, I didn't know, you sounded like you were wrapping up. I thought that was, I thought you were going to skip all that stuff. You do it, you do it, you do it. Sorry, I'm, I'm in the middle. So this is the series finale of The Loudcast. 
Um, there are things on the horizon, um, but yeah, we have had an amazing season. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to Kev prattle on with many amazing, amazing guests. Um, we have been incredibly lucky in our lineup uh, this year with all of the fantastic Loudcast guests. There are many ways that you can listen to the Loudcast, so obviously, um, the way that you are currently listening to it. There is YouTube, there is uh, all of the different audio podcasting platforms. So please check them out. But um, we will be gone from your airwaves for a bit. And we hope that you use that time to catch up on our back catalog. Is there anything that hey. you wanted to add there, Kev? No, no, that's it. Like I've been, I've been super pleased with the live cast. Uh, like this has been a kind of pilot season for us to, you know, figure out how to do it and like, <laughs> if it would work and, and, and be sustainable and stuff. And I think it has. Like the feedback means so much. You know, people who are watching it and engaging with it. Like, please do. You know, leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it. You know, let us. You know, tell us what you want to see next. Um, yeah, we can't talk too much about it, but there are plans to to be back. We will be back with you know uh, a kind of. Uh, little updates uh, that's going to be exciting stay engaged uh, through April you know with, with <laughs> Napo Rimo and stuff like that uh, we, we're going to have a, a lot coming out over the next few weeks so yeah just just thank you so much if you've been watching this whole series uh, it means a lot I've learned a bunch because I speak to writers who are smarter than I am and like I steal what they say and parrot it as my own and that is <laughs> you know you can do that too if you watch along with these podcasts <laughs> So, so Kev, this is normally the point where you ask the guest uh, where they can find you online. Um, I'm, I'm going to assume here, you're man. just going to say... Just here. <laughs> yeah, just, just right here. Just right here. Subscribe um, to this channel. You, it's where I, you know, any of my stuff I put out through I Am Loud. It's the luxury of being a creative director. <laughs> and so, like, you know, check out our, our Facebooks and Twitters and all that jazz. Like, yeah, just find spoken word, though. Like, you know, if you don't particularly enjoy what we do, there's a bunch of other people who do something slightly different and like you know spoken word in general deserves a big platform yeah. there will be a night close to you when things go back to normal go and support it go yeah. buy a book from speculative books or you know go to, to an open mic or something like that just yeah I, I love spoken word and I just I hope that all of this contributes to raising its profile so yeah you big nerd that was beautiful. <laughs> um, so we are going to, in a moment, continue our chat over on the Loudcast Extra. But this is our episode. Thank you so much for watching. Um, please do listen to the back catalog if you have not yet. Um, and now all that remains is for me to ask my beautiful guest to say goodbye. Say goodbye, Kevin. Goodbye, Kevin. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, we'd appreciate it if you could hit the like button, if you could hit the subscribe button, and make sure to ring that bell icon so you don't miss any updates from us in the future. If you want to go that extra mile and support us a little further, we do have a Patreon channel with loads of exclusive goodies, and you can sign up for as little as a dollar a month. We appreciate your help, guys, and hopefully we'll see you again soon.